Hello, and thank you for choosing TimTheTrainer.com for your training needs. My name is Tim, and I'm going to be your trainer today. Today, we are going to be doing a training on recognizing and preventing child abuse and neglect. Before we get started, let's go over just a couple of training tips to make sure that your training is successful and fully recognized by child care licensing and tech pads. Um, this training is verified by the Texas Early Childhood Professional D Database or Development System. The training ID is 27108. When you are completing trainings with TimTheTrainer.com, make sure that your personal portal has your individual personal TechPeds training ID number uh, entered. For any training that is verified with TechPeds, your certificate of completion will be automatically loaded, uh, uploaded into your TechPeds account. Um, if you do not have a TechPeds account, we encourage you to get one, um, but if you don't, make sure you leave that blank um, in your portal. Uh, your TechPeds ID is not your Tim the Trainer charge account uh, number that is given to you by your school for those of you that have a charge account set up with us. If you do not have a charge account set up with us, once again, you don't have to worry about that part right there. Just a couple of other helpful training tips for you. Um, because time spent in meetings and trainings is uh, compensated time, um, per the Texas Guidebook for Employers with Texas Workforce Commission, the number of hours of training that you complete in one day cannot exceed the number of hours worked in a day. Uh, otherwise, that's going to be a big red flag with Texas Workforce Commission. Also, with that being said, uh, the number of hours of training that you complete in one day cannot exceed the number of hours in a day, meaning you cannot complete more than 24 hours of training in a 24-hour period. Uh, so uh, just watch out for that. Um, if licensing notices that you complete more training hours than there are in a day or you complete uh, more training hours than you actually work that day, they may not accept your certificate. So I just want to make sure that you're in compliance and that you kind of know uh, these tips right here. All right. As you go through this training today, make sure that you're paying attention. This is such an incredibly important topic. Make sure that you're taking notes um, and kind of make a to-do list uh, of, of items to go back and speak to your center director, questions that you can ask your center director. We want to make sure that you're fully knowledgeable of the information that we are about to go over. This topic today, recognizing and preventing child abuse, neglect, exploitation, and sexual abuse, is a required training with the child care minimum standards. You can see here on the screen that there's actually several requirements for this particular topic. This topic must be done as part of new hire orientation. So anytime you are hired at your center, um, you have to go through child abuse and neglect training at the time of hire. It's also part of annual training requirements for both caregivers and directors. So this is a very important topic that you have to go over every single year. We want to make sure everyone fully understands the expectations for protecting the children in our care. Also, there is a minimum standard regarding personnel records that there is a signed statement that you understand uh, the reporting guidelines and that you understand the requirement for annual training for abuse and neglect that has to be in your personnel records. And then also your center must have this in your operating policies that you have a policy that employees understand that they are trained annually on recognizing and preventing child abuse and neglect and that the, what their uh, expectations are with reporting requirements and the ability to provide families with community resources. This does have to be in your operating policy and it is something that you need to sign off on. When you get done with this training today, I encourage you to reach out to your center director and have them go over your center's policy on abuse and neglect. Make sure that you see that, you understand it, ask questions if you've got questions because you have to agree to this policy before you can work with young children in the classroom. All right, so there are the minimum standard requirements that you want to be aware of right here.
Moving on, um, we've got a couple of uh, objectives, goals and objectives for today's training right here. So we want to make sure that you understand the federal and state mandated reporting expectations. We'll talk about that at the very beginning um, so that you've got that. You are required under federal law to be a mandated reporter, both when you are on the clock and off the clock. And that is a big thing that people uh, don't understand. Um, you are a mandated reporter for child abuse, neglect, exploitation, and sexual abuse, not only when you're in the classroom with the young children, but even after hours at nights and weekends, you are considered a mandated reporter under federal law. So if you witness anything that is suspected abuse, that is something that has to be reported. We want to make sure that you are familiar with and that you know the different types of abuse that you could possibly see in your program. Something that I'm really going to focus on in this training is not only recognizing and preventing abuse and neglect, but also giving you some skills that you can practice so that you are not the abuser. All right. Um, this is what we most commonly see and licensed child care programs is the teachers in the classroom who are not demonstrating competency, using good judgment, not maintaining self-control, um, and when your emotions get high, when you get frustrated or stressed, you are the ones that actually cause the abuse in the classroom. We want to make sure that you've got the skills so that that does not happen, all right? We have to keep our children safe while they are in our care. So um, the last objective we have here is to learn different ways to recognize possible signs of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and sexual abuse. Okay, so we're going to be we're going to be bouncing between you know two different um, expectations here: understanding and reporting suspected abuse and neglect uh, with the families that we work with, but then also what could possibly happen in the classroom with your own behaviors. We want to make sure that you are also protected, that you've got the skills so that you uh, don't end up on, on the other end of this right here. All right. You know, what is abuse when we talk about, you know, child abuse, neglect, exploitation, and sexual abuse? I've got the definition right here on the screen for you. You know, abuse is any intentional knowing or reckless act by omission by someone working under the support or approval of an operation that causes or may cause emotional or physical injury to or the death of a child that the operation services. Okay, so basically what this is saying right here is that when you do not use good judgment, when you do not maintain self-control, while you are on the premises of the licensed facility, if you have any behavior that places that child at risk, all right, that could be considered abuse. It could be considered neglect. It can be considered exploitation, all right? Um, it could be considered, considered sexual abuse um, if you go down that route. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone clearly understands that. Um, what this is right here. So while you are working in a classroom, if you do not maintain self-control and have good judgment and you have any behavior with a child, okay, knowing or reckless behavior that places them at risk, you could be charged with abuse and neglect. This is not just the families that we work with that we're talking about here. It's also the people in the classroom. I understand that right now, in today's world, everyone has a very narrow window of tolerance, okay? Um, a lot of people, you know, their frustration level is high, their stress level is high. We are dealing with behaviors in the classroom that we, you know, a lot of people have never seen before. All right, and I've got a lot of other trainings that will address the reason why we are seeing these behaviors and what we can do to support these children, right? But, you know, when, when we don't maintain composure, when we don't have good judgment, you know, we could be the ones that are, are the abusers. 
and, and we want to make sure that that doesn't happen right there. Okay. So let's kind of talk about the uh, responsibilities that we have um, as a mandated reporter. Once again, referring back to the child care minimum standards, under 746.201, the permit holder responsibilities, reporting and ensuring that your employees and volunteers report suspected abuse, neglect, exploitation directly to the Texas Abuse and Neglect Hotline. Like I mentioned earlier, under federal law, we are mandated reporters. Whoever suspects the abuse has to be the one to report it, all right? Now, what exactly do I mean whenever I say suspected abuse? The way I like to define suspected abuse is can you write it down, right? A child comes into your program and they have unexplained marks and bruises. A child has a particular behavior in a classroom. Um, the child has a particular language or they say something that is an indicator of abuse. These are all things that you can write down. That would be considered suspected abuse. Another question I commonly get is, you know, if I suspect abuse in a classroom, can I take a picture of the child? All right. I would be very careful doing that because you're opening yourself up to a lot of other possible consequences. Number one, under the Privacy Act, you can never take a photograph of a child without permission from the parent. And the parent must uh, know the intent behind taking the picture. So taking a picture of a child with possible ab abuse without permission from that parent, that could go into violation of privacy. All right, so you've got to be very, very careful. You also never want to take a picture of a child that makes them feel ashamed or belittled. All right, so you've got to be very careful in how you do this. If you're in a situation and you're like, Tim, I'm going to take a picture, you know, uh, of that child, I will take the risk of violating privacy. Here we go. When we talk about suspicion, if you are suspicious enough to take a picture, that is reportable, all right, 100% reportable. And you can get into uh, trouble for failure to report. Um, I could tell you all lots and lots of cases that I'm aware of where people have been charged with failure to report uh, when they were aware of suspected abuse. So you got to make sure that, that that suspicion is very well documented, that it's legitimate, all right? Now, like I said, you cannot delegate the reporting responsibility. So whoever suspects the abuse has to be the one to report it. So, for example, if a teacher uh, suspects abuse in a classroom, um, you cannot go to your center director and say, hey, center director, um, I have a child in my classroom that's being abused. Can you call and report it? All right. Um, whoever suspects the abuse has to be the one to report it. Now, um, in that case right there, okay, in a real life scenario, what is most likely going to happen is if a teacher goes to the director and says, hey, director, I have a child in my classroom um, that is being abused. The director is most likely going to respond and ask, what's up? Why do you think that? And then the teacher may say, well, um, you know, there is a particular type of behavior. There was a comment that was made. There's particular play that's happening. There's, there's unexplained marks and bruises. And then the director is probably going to respond and say, well, I should go look into this. And the director is going to go back into the classroom, observe the child, ask some questions, um, do some observations of their own. And then the director may come back and say, you know what, I think you're right. So now, who else suspects the abuse? The director does. So at this point, you have two individuals with a suspicion. At that point, the director can call and make the report on behalf of themselves and the teacher. All right? And that's most likely how things are going to happen here. All right? Um, 
The other thing that you need to know is that um, you cannot require someone to seek approval to uh, report suspected abuse and neglect. So in your operating policies, you cannot require employees to come to the center director before they call and make a report. You can recommend that they come and speak to the director. The director may have information about that family that the teacher is not aware of that may you know, skew the suspicion, all right? So it is definitely recommended that the teacher have a conversation with the director, but you cannot make that a requirement, okay? So that's pretty important right there too. The last thing on uh, the reporting expectations that everyone needs to be aware of is that just because you make the report does not give you the privilege of knowing the outcome. A lot of times whenever I'm teaching a class, I will have someone say to me, you know, well, one time we had a child in my program that was being abused. We called and reported it and nothing happened. Well, you don't know that. All right. Just because you made the report doesn't give you the privilege of knowing the outcome. OK, so I know this is hard because we want to protect the children. We want to do the right thing, um, you know, but but sometimes we just have to trust the system. Your part of this is to call and make the report. It is Child Protective Services job to do the investigation, uh, to apply any consequences and to take further action. So sometimes we just have to live with the fact that we did our part, all right? Um, now, whenever they come in to investigate, you definitely don't want to interfere with that investigation. That includes notifying the parents of an investigation. That could be considered interference with a state investigation and you can be criminally charged for that. So once again, it is Child Protective Services job to notify that parent of um, them coming in to, to interview the child or to look into a situation. Um, they are the ones that will make that notification, so you don't want to interfere. However, to, from, from time to time, they may ask you to sit in with uh, the child so that there is a, a comfortable adult um, that, that the child feels comfortable with. Um, if they ask you to do that, you need to comply but you also need to know that you are now knee deep into this investigation and you are now speaking on behalf of the child, okay? And most of you are probably gonna have no problem doing that because we wanna do whatever we have to do to keep the children safe, all right? Also, just when we look at the child care minimum standards under 746-1203 under additional responsibilities of personnel, um, we are required to report suspected abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So you, once again, you're going to see this in multiple different chapters in the child care minimum standards um, that we have to make sure that this is not happening and we have to make sure that this is being reported um, as expected. I did give you the most current Texas abuse and neglect hotline phone number right there on the screen so you can see this. This also is required to be posted in your program next to every telephone number that is used by the licensed program. Um, also needs to be included in your parent handbook so that the parents have that responsibility, uh, have access to that phone number as well. All right, remember, you are the voice of the child, especially when you're dealing with nonverbal children that can't speak for themselves. All right, so the following are some signs often associated with a particular type of abuse and neglect. So we're gonna talk about physical abuse, we're gonna talk about neglect, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse, in addition to just your, your general abuse and neglect. It is important to note, note, however, that these types of abuses are more typically found in a combination rather than alone. So for example, a physically abused child um, is often emotionally abused as well. And a sexually abused child is very often that they are also neglected. So you're, you're gonna see some of these combinations in some types of situations. 
first off, let's just kind of skip down to the third bullet right there and let me tell you a little bit about exploitation. We live in a world of social media these days and it's really important that we understand what exploita exploitation is. Exploitation is using a child for personal gain. It does not have to be financial gain. But anytime you use a child for personal gain, that can be considered exploitation. The reason why I'm telling you this is this is one of our biggest legal trends in the early education industry these days. It's when uh, teachers post pictures of children in their classroom on their personal social media accounts. That can be considered exploitation especially given the intent behind it. So we always recommend that you have a policy in your program that your employees are prohibited from posting pictures of children enrolled in your program on their personal social media accounts. We want to make sure that you are protected. We want to make sure that the children are protected. The biggest trend that we're seeing right now with this one are you know your your TikTok videos or your reels where people are actually taking videos of the children in the classroom and posting them on TikTok or or Facebook or Instagram, uh, creating those stories. Um, and y'all, that is definitely exploitation. And once again, I can tell you lots and lots of stories about people that have been arrested and are now sitting in a jail cell because of their TikTok videos. So once again, this is a big no-no. Uh, you don't want to do that in your program. All right, let's kind of move on right here. Let's talk about some signs of abuse and some common indicators. So we're, we're going to first talk about what to look for with the child, but then also what to look for with um, the adults that are working with that child. So either the parent or the guardian uh, or, you know, the caregiver themselves in the classroom. So for the child, you know, common indicators would include bruises or wounds in various stages of healings. So, you know, it's not that you just have a, a fresh bruise that probably happened yesterday, but there are multiple bruises. Some are new, some are old. They're in various different stages of healing, meaning that there is an ongoing sign of injury, right? You might want to look for that. That could possibly be an indicator of abuse. It could also just be a rambunctious child that is very physically active, um, that has a low tolerance of pain and is on the playground and falls a lot or falls off of their bicycle or does a lot of rough and tumble play. Okay, so you got to be able to see the difference between the two. Just because you have bruises or wounds in various stages of healings doesn't 100% mean that it's an indicator of abuse. It could just be that they're being a child, uh, which is very common in our industry right here. Injuries on two or more planes or, or sides of the body, okay? So, you know, typically when someone falls down, they will fall on one side of their body. But if they have bruises or injuries on multiple different sides or planes or area of the body, um, that could be an indicator right there. Um, injuries reported uh, to be caused by falling, but which do not include hands, knees, or forehead. You know, sometimes when we're doing our health checks, we'll uh, kind of say something to a parent about, oh, you know, I, I see here that Leslie has a, a bruise on her, you know, a bruise on her side. Uh, what happened? You know, oh well, she fell at home. Well, typically when someone falls, uh, the injury is going to be on the hands, the knees, or the forehead because this is the part of the body that is going to hit the ground or hit the piece of furniture first in most situations. Not all situations, but most situations. So again, if it's an injury that is on a part of the body that's not a hand, knee, or forehead, and someone is saying, well, they fell, we want to look into that a little bit more, okay? Or we want to look at other possible signs um, of abuse or neglect when those type of comments are made right there. Um, you know, we want to look for um, 
oval or uh, immersions or donut shaped or imprinted um, marks on the body that could be caused by hot liquids, uh, donut shaped that could be caused by cigarette burns or, or electronic cigarette or vapes. Um, that definitely is something that we want to look out for right there. When you have a child that is reluctant to leave school, uh, when they want to come in early, when they want to stay late, um, you might want to refer to my training on understanding attachment styles. We talk about this in that particular training where we talk about the separation uh, from the child and the parent. Uh, the reuniting with the parent and the child and what type of behaviors you see during those times. Um, that could definitely be an indicator of anxious attachment or avoidant attachment or disorganized attachment. Um, so again, we want to make sure that we're documenting this, um, kind of keeping our eye on it, but that could be an indicator right there. All right. Um, that, that there are perceived threats of danger at home from the child's point of view. Therefore, they, they prefer to be at school rather than being at home. Um, that's what we're looking for. Um, you know, children that are inappropriately uh, dressed for the weather. Um, now, we are in Texas. Most people that are doing my trainings are in Texas. Um, this is a hard one because, you know, we have summer and winter and spring and fall all in one day. And if the parent doesn't watch their news or, or keep up with the weather on their smartphone, then, you know, very likely could be inappropriately dressed for the weather on that day. We do it as adults as well. But again, if this is happening on a regular basis, you want to make sure that you're documenting that. Um, that could be an indicator right there. A child that is having discomfort when they're sitting down uh, meaning that they have some pain or discomfort um, in their bottom area uh, due to being spanked or swatted. That is an indicator that we want to keep out for. A child that has sophisticated sexual knowledge or sophisticated sexual play uh, could also be an indicator as well. All right. Now, don't get child-on-child -child exploratory play confused here. That is something that is very common in our industry right here. Um, but if it's sophisticated and they're using language or behavior that is beyond what is normal for their age, that could definitely be an indicator. Radical changes in their behavior from one day to the next, that could be an indicator right there. Uh, a child that withdraws or they watch the adult that they are reuniting with very closely, um, that is a big indicator. I could tell y'all stories about that one right there, um, about a particular child that the, the moment his dad walked into the classroom to pick him up, uh, he kind of instantly froze and watched his father very, very intently. Um, and, and come to find out there were definitely some things happening at home that, that had to be reported and dealt with, okay? Or, you know, if the child seems to expect abuse by flinching, changing their body language, becoming very passive with the behavior or the interaction with the adult, we want to look for that. And one of the most common things that we see and hear in our classrooms is revealing discussions, stories, artwork, or drawings that the child is doing. You know, pay really close attention to the children when they are in dramatic play, when they're in the block center. These are two uh, common learning centers that children will play adult roles, but they will also relive real life experiences. So when you're doing your observations and assessments, paying very close attention to what's happening and what's being said um, in, in these particular learning centers, this is important for you right here, all right? And by the way, they don't just pretend to be mom and dad, they also pretend to be you, all right? And so, you know, you can kind of see the child's perception of you and their version of reality on how you interact and engage with the child when they're pretending to be you in dramatic play or the home center or in block center. 
Um, and a lot of times teachers will go, oh, yeah, I don't act that way. I don't talk like that. Well, that's the child's version of reality, and we can learn a lot from that right there. We see sudden changes in school performance. This is something we want to look for right here. Or if they have not received help for physical or medical problems brought to parents' attention. You want to look out for this, document all of this stuff as well. Now when we talk about the adult that is interacting with the child, so once again, this could be parent, this could be guardian, this could be caregiver or teacher. Uh, here are some common indicators of abuse. Unrealistic expectations for the child. Um, the, the unrealistic expectations for social and emotional needs. We want to look for that. Uh, lack of basic child-rearing knowledge or skills. Now remember, parents are doing the best they can with the skills they've got. So we want to be curious, not judgmental. It might be that we just need to lend additional skills to that family. Substance abuse shows little concern for the child whenever you are reporting uh, situations. Denies the existence or blames the child for problems in school. If the parent asks the teacher to use harsh discipline when the child misbehaves at school, so basically a parent not understanding that, you know, behavior is a sign of communication. Behavior is an opportunity to teach a new skill, right? So if they want to go immediately to punishment rather than discipline, uh, you know, you might want to document that and keep an eye on it. Um, if the parent sees the child as entirely bad or worthless or treats the child as if they are a burden, you want to pay attention to that, document this type of behavior and conversation. And this is a big one right here. When, when the adult, once again, whether it's the parent, the guardian, um, family member picking up the child, or even the teacher in the classroom, if they rarely make eye contact with each other, or they have a hard time maintaining eye contact, that could be an indicator as well. All right, um, children typically want to make eye contact with you. Eye contact is the window to the soul. This is how we have healthy connections is through healthy eye contact. So this is a big indicator for you to consider right here. Let's talk really quickly about signs of physical abuse. Now, a lot of times physical abuse is, is very quickly identified. It's one of the types of abuse that is the easiest to identify. Um, so, you know, a lot of this you probably already know, but let's just kind of talk about it as well. Um, once again, has uh, unexplained burns, bites, bruises, broken bones, or black eyes that the adult can't explain. Um, has faded bruises or marks uh, noticeable after the absence from school. Uh, if the child seems frightened of the parents and protest or cries when it's time to go home. So once again, we're talking about the reuniting with the parent. If they shrink when the adult approaches them, um, or if they just simply report injury by a parent or another adult caregiver. You want to make sure that you document this right here. Things to look for with the adult. So once again, the parent, the guardian, the adult picking up the child, or the teacher in the classroom. Um, an indicator here is offering conflicting or unconvincing or no explanation of the child's injury. If they describe the child as evil or in other some very negative way. If they use harsh physical discipline with the child. So using punishment rather than discipline. Or if the adult has history of abuse themselves. Okay. Um, they may be rewriting that script or reliving that script, that script with their own mental models and their own negative biases. All right. This could possibly be an indicator that you want to look for as well. Let's talk now about um, signs of neglect. Okay. 
And when we talk about neglect, are the child's personal needs being met? Now, one thing I have definitely learned in my career when it comes to neglect, a lot of times the parents that we are working with are doing the best they can with what they've got. All right? When you've got a situation like this, that's not neglect. All right? If they're doing the best they can with what they've got. In these types of situations, that parent just needs additional resources. They need support, right? They need understanding and guidance. We should be the advocate for the entire family in these types of situations, all right? Now, um, if, the, if the parent does have the means of meeting the child's personal needs and it's not happening, then that could be a, a sign of neglect at that point. So some signs to look out for is frequently absent from school. Um, if, if the child is begging or stealing food or money, um, they have a lack of medical attention, a lack of dental care, uh, they're not receiving their immunizations unless it conflicts with a belief or conviction. They're not getting their vision screening. They're not, they don't have glasses when needed. These could all be indicators of neglect right here. If the child is consistently dirty or wearing dirty clothes or they have a severe body odor, this could be an indicator of neglect. They have sufficient clothing for the weather, okay? That could be one. A child that abuses alcohol or other drugs or a child that simply says there is no adult at home to care for them. Also, we want to consider the possibility of neglect when the parent or the other adult caregiver appears to be indifferent to the child, appears to be apathetic or depressed. They have behaviors that are irrational or bizarre in some manner. Or if you have a parent that is abusing alcohol or other illegal drugs, this could be an indicator of possible neglect right here. The next thing we want to be aware of is signs of sexual abuse uh, and kind of look at some of these uh, common indicators right here. Probably one of the biggest things you want to look for with sexual abuse, does the child have bizarre, sophisticated, or unusual sexual knowledge or behavior for their particular age? All right. Now remember, we are living in a world of social media. We are living in the world of smartphones and tablets. Uh, children have access to a lot of media that is possibly not appropriate for their age. Um, and they're learning a lot of behaviors way earlier than they should. All right. So, you know, a lot of times when we see some of this sophisticated behavior, it's not necessarily because they have experienced it but it's because they've seen it in media, all right? Now, that's still something that we need to document. This could still be something that is possibly reported, okay? But kind of keep that in mind right there. We, we don't want to jump to a conclusion right here. But when we are looking at signs of sexual abuse, you know, the child has a difficult time walking or sitting, they suddenly refuse to change clothes uh, or participate in physical activities. The child cries or becomes very uncomfortable whenever you're changing a diaper or assisting them with toileting or when they have an accident and you have to assist them. If they report nightmares, they start bedwetting. Um, after they've been potty trained, they start having accidents. This could be an indicator right here sudden changes to their appetite. And then once again, they demonstrate bizarre, sophisticated, or unusual sexual knowledge or behavior. Um, children that may run away from home, so when we're talking about our K through 12 uh, children right here. Um, and of course, if a child reports sexual abuse by a parent or another adult caregiver, they actually come out and tell you this happens then that is definitely an indicator that would require reporting. 
when we're talking about the adult uh, person, if they um, are very protective of the child or they want to limit the child's interaction with other people, uh, this could be an indicator right here, especially people of the opposite sex, all right? That could be an indicator. They become very secretive and isolated or they become very jealous or controlling members of the family. Those could be indicators of sexual abuse right there. All right, signs of emotional maltreatment. Consider the possibility of emotional maltreatment when the child shows extreme behavior, such as being overly compliant or demanding behavior, or it could be extreme passivity or aggression. All right, uh, we wanna look for that right there. If either inappropriately um, adulting you know, could be a factor right there. The child is rocking their head, they're banging their head. Uh, these are things that we wanna look for. You know, does the child have that extreme behavior or even rage? Now, again, this is a whole nother training that you can, you can get on my website, the difference between aggression and rage. There is a big difference between the two, but when you have a child that is in a rage situation, um, that could, lead uh, be an indicator of emotional maltreatment right there. If a child is delayed in physical or emotional development, they have attempted suicide, or they have a lack of attachment to the parent. Once again, I'm gonna refer you to my training on understanding attachment styles uh, for more information on that one. But again, what we really wanna look for here is the reuniting or the separation uh, between the child and the adult. Okay, these could be big indicators of emotional maltreatment or abuse. When we're talking about the adult or other adult caregiver, when you have an adult that is constantly blaming, belittling, or berating the child, all right, this could be a sign of emotional abuse. If they're unconcerned about the child and refuses to consider offers for help uh, for the child's problem, this could be a sign of neglect right here. Or if the adult just rejects the child, rejects the uh, existence of the child, these could be indicators for you. All right, there we go. So we've talked about the uh, common, common indicators of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and sexual abuse. Let's talk about how we can prevent this. Okay. And when we talk about preventing abuse and neglect, we want to make sure that every adult um, has the ability to demonstrate competency, to have good judgment, to maintain self-control when, when in the presence of the child and when performing their duties. I have several trainings on my website that deal with this particular topic, how to, how to maintain that composure how to change the power of, uh, of perception and understand the power of perception, to practice that positive intent, that when you're working with a child, understanding that all behavior is a sign of communication, that child is trying to tell you something the only way they know how, okay? All behavior is an opportunity to teach. It is an opportunity to make a difference. And basically what we wanna practice in our classroom, everything we do in our classroom should always be an adult first, child second model. The adult must maintain composure. They must self-regulate and have the ability to self-regulate before you can expect a child to do that. All right? Uh, I talk a lot about conscious discipline. Many of you are familiar with conscious discipline. Um, written by the amazing Dr. Becky Bailey. If you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to look it up, consciousdiscipline.com. But we wanna make sure that every adult working with children has the ability to self-regulate. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, when we talk about understanding and, pre and preventing child abuse and neglect, people immediately wanna go to what is the parent doing at home that could be abuse or neglect? 
but we fail to realize that a lot of the abuse, neglect, and exploitation happens right in our classrooms. So we have to be fully aware. Do you have the mental ability to make a good decision at this moment? Do you know your triggers? Okay, write your triggers now. What are things, uh, write them down. What are things that children say or do in the classroom that you know pushes your button? All right, and whenever the child has that behavior, you stop, you take a deep breath, you relax, and you tell yourself, I am safe, I can handle this. I can help this child with their problem, okay? We want to know the difference between responding to a child versus reacting to a child. It's the ability to hit the internal pause button. And as an early educator, you always have to be consciously aware of that internal pause button and when I am not in my executive state, when I am in my emotional state, when I am in my survival state, I should not be interacting or engaging with that child until I self-regulate. Because if you do, you could cause abuse and you personally could have consequences to that. Not just the center that you're working at, okay? but you as an individual could be criminally charged okay, for what you do to a child in that classroom. So you always have to be aware of that. It's not just the center that has consequences for abuse and neglect. It's not just the parent or guardian that has consequences uh, to abuse and neglect. It's all of us that are working in the classroom with the children. We have to practice composure on a daily basis, all right? Know the difference between responding versus reacting. Once again, I have tons of trainings on my website, timthetrainer.com, to help you with self-regulation, to help you with composure, to help you with self-control, to help you be in that positive mental state so that we can help the children and support the children, not hurt them. And then pass these skills on to the families. Remember, you are an advocate for the entire family, not just that child. And understand that most of your families are doing the best they can with the skills they've got. It is our job as proud early educators to lend skills to families in addition to lending skills to children. If we work together, the power of unity, okay, we can keep our children safe. You've got this. Last thing that we have right here to share with you, um, we are required by child care regulations to share community services and support with our families. The best way to start is to go to childwelfare.gov and then you can just do some simple internet searches in your local community for supporting individuals with preventing uh, child abuse, neglect, exploitation, and sexual abuse. Once again, refer to your center's policies on community services and how we can offer that support. Also for yourself, if you know that you're struggling with self-regulation, if you're struggling with composure in the classroom, don't be afraid to go to your center director and ask for support. You are not alone in this right here. There are plenty of opportunities to get additional training, to practice new skills, Okay, have a role model come into the classroom and practice with you. So we have to take ownership over this ourselves as well. Don't wait for someone to come in and, and offer that support. When you feel that you're getting triggered, 
when you feel that you don't have the skill to stay to stay regulated ask someone for help okay um, there are plenty of resources out there make sure that you follow me on facebook tim the trainer um, i i post a lot of resources to help teachers and parents uh, keep children safe um, also look for your center director for your local and community resources to help you out Awesome, you did it. You have watched this video on recognizing and preventing abuse and neglect. You are now going to take an assessment uh, with some questions in order to receive your certificate of completion. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about the material that was covered today or if you want additional information related to the material that we discussed. You can email me Tim, T-Y-M, at timthetrainer.com, or you can call our training hotline, 972-200-0504. Both my email address and our phone number is located on our website, timthetrainer.com. I don't want anyone to ever feel like you're in this alone. We are in this together, okay? Um, we are all in this together, and we are here to support each other, okay? Um, thank you very much for completing this training. I appreciate every single one of you. Have a wonderful rest of your day.